A very good morning everyone. It's uh, great to see you in church this morning. It's wonderful to see you on this first day of September. Uh, next week I think it's going to be uh, going back to school, isn't it, for a lot of uh, children and, and young people. Perhaps a mixture of excitement, a bit of anxiety perhaps. Also for the teachers going back, not just for the children and young people. But it's great we can gather here this morning and we can, we can set aside the demands and pressures of the world and we can come together, we can worship God. God is good and God is in control of all things and it's wonderful to be able to gather and to worship him. He is worthy of all our worship. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We say together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. A little bit later on in the service we shall share the bread and the wine. And Jesus, referring to that, says this, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Let's just pause and let's just reflect for a moment in that silence before God 
let's confess to him our failures and our sins, which cost him his life. And so with one voice, we confess our sins by saying, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. By the death of Jesus Christ, his one and only Son, <clears throat> God has rescued us from the power of darkness and brought us safe into the kingdom of his dear Son. In Jesus, we are set free. Our sins are forgiven. Amen. Merciful God, your Son came to save us and bore our sins on the cross. May we trust in your mercy and know your love rejoicing in the righteousness that is ours through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first reading is from James 1, 17 to 27. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Oh 
The Gospel reading is taken from Mark, chapter 7, verses 1 to 8 and 14 to 23. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law, who had come from Jerusalem, gathered around Jesus. And some of his disciples, eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law ask Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, It is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, the disciples asked him about his parable. Are you so dull, he asked, don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Uh, Some of you might have heard of the uh, evangelist called uh, J. John. And he has this phrase, it goes like this. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. And that about sums up the problem facing the human race. It also about sums up what Jesus is saying here, as recorded in Mark in chapter 7 of of Mark's Gospel. And in the reading we just heard from Susan, we join the story as Jesus is, is being visited by some of the high-ranking um, theological thinkers, leaders of his day, the Pharisees. And they travelled about 70 miles uh, from Jerusalem uh, to see Jesus, to ask Jesus some questions. Wow, this is great, the disciples might have been thinking. The authorities at last taking 
um, Jesus seriously. So what's the first question they ask? Is it um, maybe asking about his miracles? Maybe asking about his uh, relationship with God? Maybe asking about what he sees the future? Sort of questions like this. So what's the first question they ask? It's this. Why aren't your disciples washing their hands before they eat? What? What? Is that the question you've travelled 70 miles for to ask? Are you kidding? But this question already reveals how Jesus and the Pharisees, the religious folk of the day, are on completely different pages. The Pharisees, when they saw the human condition, they, they, they saw the solution. They saw the solution as, as it could be solved by following all the, the man-made traditions, the tradition of the elders, as it was translated there, and following them to the letter. And all these traditions had been built up over, hundred, over centuries around the Old Testament laws, the God-given laws. And in stark contrast uh, to that, Jesus says to them, you hypocrites. And he quotes the prophet Isaiah. He says, these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And this is a major clash. The Pharisees believed, if you like, they believed in self-help. They didn't believe in God's help. They believed in a religion, not a relationship. They believed you could be good enough by doing all the do's and not doing all the don'ts. And they were blind. They didn't see what God really wanted, which was a relationship with them. As Billy Graham once famously said, the criteria for someone to become a Christian isn't that we think we're good enough. It's whether you are bad enough. Jesus came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The Pharisees thought that the, um, the human problem was a superficial problem. Something that, that could be solved by following the tra traditional rules and regulations. And if we did that, they thought God would be happy. We'd all be sorted. But Jesus is saying the human problem isn't a superficial problem. It's a deep, deep problem. It's a massive problem problem. It's a problem with our hearts. And Jesus' mission was to come as our saviour, to solve the problem of our, of our hearts. And only he can solve that problem. It's what comes out of the heart which makes us unclean, Jesus said. And you can wash and scrub all you like on the outside. It will make no difference to your heart and only Jesus is able to deal with the uncleanness in our hearts but you know this clash isn't just between Jesus and the Pharisees it's actually a clash with all of us it's a clash with our culture today it's in the nature of all of us as human beings that we can we think we can we can better ourselves by our own efforts that's what our culture tells us all the time um, 
some people will think that capitalism will make us better human beings, a better community. Others think that socialism will make us better. But if anyone thinks that politics is the ultimate answer, uh, you'll be disappointed. Because neither of those systems will do that. The sins of the human heart will just express themselves differently um, in each of those systems. Political systems do not change the heart. Economics doesn't change our hearts either. Giving us more wealth doesn't change our hearts. Or giving us better health care or a better education. These things can't change what comes out of the human heart. Every generation will always have a go, of course, to do that, which is why every generation has to have the gospel preached to them afresh. Because the, each generation is always looking for different ways to cleanse ourselves, to, to find the solution to the, to the human condition, to cover up that uncleanness somehow. But nothing works. As Jeremiah says, he says, the Lord says, speaking to the people of Israel, you are stained with guilt and no soap or bleach can wash it away. And Jesus says the same. He says, we are the problem. That's what he's saying here in this, in this reading. Our human nature is stained. What comes out of our heart, which is our na human nature, uh, is our self-centeredness and, and, and our sinfulness. Now, it may be that some are sitting here now and thinking to yourself, well, but I'm a good person. I'm not addicted to anything. I'm loving. I don't get angry. I don't hit people. I spend time with the family. I, I read the Bible. I pray. I go to church. I give to charity. I help at charities. I, I, I help in their shops. I take my neighbor's bin out. I care for people who are lonely. I invite them for a coffee. I do their shopping. I phone them. Yeah. I know I'm not perfect. But what more do you want? Well, you made the point in that last phrase. I'm not perfect. And don't get me wrong, all those things and many more are, are all really good things to do. But the point is, however good they are and however much you do them, they don't get your heart right. We human beings are fabulously, wonderfully made. We're made in God's image, but we're also fatally flawed. We've rebelled against, against God. And the problem is inside of us. It's not outside of us. Our hearts are stained. And washing hands or cups or pitchers or kettles, it doesn't solve it. I'm not sure if we could say there's a sin which God particularly detests above any other sin. But in the gospel narratives, what we do see is Jesus reacting most strongly to one particular sin. What is that? What is that sin? Is it murder? No. Is it theft? No. Nope. Adultery? Immorality? No. Nope. None of those. It's this, which is on display here, in this reading. It's self-righteous hypocrisy. 
because that's the one sin that negates the gospel none of those other sins do that because they can all be confessed and forgiven and so can self-righteousness of course that can be forgiven but it's harder to confess self-righteousness because by definition if someone is self-righteous they don't see their sinfulness they see their own self-righteousness and that is the hypocrisy of the Pharisee they don't see the plank in their own eye they only see the speck in the other's eye you might remember uh, the parable uh, Jesus told again he told it to the Pharisees and uh, he told it when they muttered against him because he was mixing always with sinful people and the parable he told them was the parable of the prodigal son And in that parable, the Pharisees are represented by the elder son. And the elder son is self-righteous. And at the end of the story, the elder son says to his father, just look at how bad your younger son has been. He's wasted everything all his inheritance is in riotous living and now when he comes back you've thrown him a big party compare that to me I've been here all this time look how good I've been I've worked I've stayed at home I've done everything that's needed but I've never had a party like this younger brother of mine And the last part of the story, in fact, the last sentence is the father saying this to the elder son. Everything I have is yours. And he begs his elder son to come and join them in the celebration. He says, for we have to celebrate. For this brother of yours was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and the story the parable ends there and we don't know what happens and you know it's very easy for people like us like like you and me churchgoers or simply just good people they don't have to be Christians, you can be an atheist or whoever. But we can be just like this elder brother. We say or we think, well, I'm not like that bad person. Look at him or look at her. He's a womanizer, he's a liar, a thief, a gossip, a flirt. I'm not like that. I live by quite different standards to that. And if that's us thinking that, that's bad news. We're not at the celebration. The younger son is. With all his failures and rough edges, he's there with the father celebrating. Why? Why? Because the younger son knows all his flaws. He couldn't, he can't hide them even if he wanted to. And this is the thing, like him, we also need to realise we're also flawed. We also miss the mark, we fall short. Out of our hearts comes all sorts of uncleanness and evil. And the self-righteous are so good at hiding that fact from themselves. Let me just finish on what seems like a throwaway line. It's an aside, really, in this whole story, in this clash that Jesus has with the, with the Pharisees. But it's a very important part, I believe, of the whole story because it tells us how we should understand the whole Bible, which, of course, the Pharisees said they were very good at understanding. 
And if you read verses 18 and 19, as Jesus is teaching his disciples about this, he says this, Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. And then Mark adds this. It's actually in brackets, I think, in some of the translations. It says this. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Um, I'm sorry for a vegan or a vegetarian, but it's saying here that all foods are clean clean and those words are really really important not because of choices and whatever people can make and that's a personal thing I'm not gonna go in that direction but what he didn't say what he didn't say is this he didn't say Jesus, Jesus didn't say oh you don't have to worry now about those eating rules about any of those food laws we can move on now they're all outdated he did not say that it says Jesus declared or Jesus announced that as of now I make these foods clean that's completely different Jesus believes in the whole Bible as, as the Word of God it doesn't go out of date it doesn't get dated it, he's saying it's true all the time it's reliable it's trustworthy it's inerrant and of course he's talking here about the Old Testament. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that not a dot or a cross will pass away from the word of God until all is fulfilled. And the point is this, Jesus isn't abolishing anything. He's not outdating anything. What he's saying is that it's fulfilled. All those eating laws, all those cleanliness laws, all those purification laws that, that they were given, rightly so, in the Old Testament, they are now fulfilled in me. That's what he's saying. Not abolished, they are fulfilled. Their purpose was to get you, the nation of Israel, and all of us who read it, read back into it, it was to get us to see, to move towards purity, to move towards clean, cleanness in every way, internally, externally, spiritually. And now Jesus is saying, in me, they are completely fulfilled. It's been done. The sacrificial system, the cleanliness laws, the food laws, they are fulfilled in me. What an incredible announcement what an incredible thing that Jesus is saying here he is the sacrifice given once and for all he gave up his life he is the only way the problem of our hearts uh, can be dealt with as Paul writes to the Corinthian church God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God beautiful the ultimate purpose of the Word of God is to introduce us to to Jesus every page of the Bible is a signpost to him we never need say and cannot say oh that bit there doesn't apply anymore we've moved on or oh, that bit there we have to make it a bit more palatable Tony only applied for there no 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 none of it will pass away it will only be fulfilled in Jesus Christ let's let's rejoice this one let's rejoice with the psalmist and say blessed is the one who delights in the law of the Lord. Blessed is the one who delights in the law of the Lord. May that be us this morning. May that be you and me this morning. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray.
Lord God, we, this morning we thank you so much for the love and mercy that you have shown to us, that we have needed, that we need. We thank you for the wonderful truths and promises in your word in the Bible and fulfilled in Jesus. Lord God, help us this morning to love your word because in it we see you. Lord, convict us of any self-righteousness. Help us to love those around us, whoever they are, whatever they've done, and fill our hearts with joy when we read your word, when we see your will is done, and when we see people coming into your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So let's declare our faith as well this morning. Let's do that as we use the words of the Nicene Creed. Let's stand and declare our faith. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, be with us in this time of prayer and help us to feel your presence. Aware of the commandments you gave to Moses, we pray that you will be worshipped above all else in our land and that we can be given the strength to reject idolatry of our secular word, world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Faithful God, we pray for the church throughout the world and especially for our churches and local community. We thank you for our leaders, Robert, Rachel and Kirsty, and for our readers, musicians, friends, and all who volunteer in our churches. We pray for our teachers and children as they return after the summer break to their schools and colleges this week. May you give them a thirst for knowledge, wisdom and understanding, and that they will not worry about things they cannot control but that you, dear Lord, will give their hearts and their minds and keep them trusting in you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Creator God, we pray for the governments of the world and all world leaders. 
that they may always seek for peaceful solutions in dealing with other nations and rule their own countries with compassion and justice. I'd like to read a prayer responding to the violence in Israel and Gaza by Reverend Peter Colwell, Deputy General Secretary of the Churches Together in Britain and Ireland, taken from their website, published the 14th of August. O God of all, of Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, Isaac and Ishmael, our hearts are broken in pieces at the suffering and murder of your people. Our voices cry for peace and for justice. Comfort those who grieve, console and heal the injured. Be close to those in fear. Restrain with your mighty hand those who perpetrate violence. Send us your wisdom in all that we say and do, that our voice may always seek justice, peace and security for all. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Creator God, we thank you that we live in a country free from war and pray for peace in your world and for the welfare of all people and for those who care for others, for our environment and for all who are in need. We pray for those who are in the news, who are victims of accidents, war, disease, violence and natural disasters. We pray and hope and we pray for peace in Ukraine and for all those countries who are torn apart by senseless violence. May you bring hope and peace throughout your world where there is conflict. Father God, we pray for all those who lead our nations of the world and those in authority that they may always work for peace and for the well-being of their people. At home, Help us all to strive for a compassionate society by recognising our own prejudices and seeking to recognise the needs of others and the needs of your planet as equally important to our own. Lord, in your mercy. Faithful Lord, we pray for those who are worried financially or facing the loss of their job we ask that you provide for their needs and guide them to opportunities that will sustain them. We pray for your healing touch on all those who are sick and pray for the gift of courage to face up to and to cope with illness. We ask that you bring them comfort and healing and that you grant wisdom and guidance to their, to their doctors and healthcare providers and for those who love them and care for them. Gracious Lord, we pray for all who are sad or upset today, the grieving, the lonely, the lost and the bereaved. May you bring light into dark places, restore hope and vision to all who struggle and bring well-being and comfort to all those who suffer. We especially pray for anyone we know who have recently died and are now on their journey to you. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteousness. In a few moments of quiet or aloud, bring before our Lord any body that you feel needs our prayers today. For Catherine, Stephen, Claudette and Gillian, may you bring comfort and healing to them, Lord Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Faithful God, we thank you for the opportunity of being together in prayer. As we look toward the week to come, we pray for an awareness of your love and support in all that we do. Merciful Father, accept these prayers 
for the sake, sake of your Son, our, our Saviour, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Elaine. Um, would you please if, uh, like to stand if you can, and we're going to share the peace now with one another. Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us now offer to one another a sign of God's peace. So we're now going to uh, turn to our hymn books. We're going to sing our offertory hymn. It's number 315. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Number 315. Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Lord God, the source of truth and love, Keep us faithful to the Apostles' teaching and fellowship, united in prayer and the breaking of bread, and one in joy and simplicity of heart, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we continue. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all our understanding, keep all your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. And so let us now go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.